gallery view. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna turn off my video just to save on bandwidth. Okay. Welcome everyone, good morning. And welcome to you on Zoom. Welcome as you are hopefully joining us on the YouTube feed via the Aaron Copeland School of Music website. I'm Mark Powell, Director of Orchestral Studies here at the Copeland School. And you join us for a two-parter centering on something that we as musicians do absolutely every day in one guise or another. Uh, when you think of the A word being audition, uh, that, that doesn't have to be the thing that you go through the semifinal and the final and sit behind a screen and play an excerpt. Um, sending in a recording for a scholarship, uh, being interviewed for admission to a program. Uh, we musicians, by simple virtue of the fact that we are performers, and we put forth a prepared public face that engages our technique and our musicality and all of the things that we work so hard to make look effortless at a moment's notice, don't spend a lot of time, unfortunately, until later, mid or later career, thinking about the mechanics of how to audition. And it's something that you can work on right now. And so to walk us through that kind of preparation in in much the same way that we've talked about foundational skills over the previous six weeks. I am delighted to welcome back Professor Frank Morelli to talk about the A word or auditioning and its mechanics, how you prep for it, and most importantly, how you think about it. Welcome back. Good to see you. Thank you. Great to be here again. Um, and I would say, just to get right down to it, this, as I pointed out in previous weeks at the outset of these uh, classes, this is part of an arc of a curriculum, you might say, that I had in mind. And we're, now we're at, you might say, the term paper. We're at the practical application. And so we started with the theory. Of course, along the way, we did playing and all as well, but, but more from a theoretical point of view. And now we're down to applying it. And in fact, I will just slightly, usually I totally agree with my colleague in his introduction. Usually. So <laughs> don't get too smart. Yeah. Blast. <laughs> I was so close. So close. No, just this time, we are going to work a little bit backwards with a final product, meaning the, the, the pieces that our wonderful students have, have contributed for today. I believe we have two flutes and a bassoon, so probably we'll go maybe flute, bassoon, flute, just to keep a certain uh, variety going. And these are three young artists that are near and dear to me because I have them in another class where we deal with a lot of the same issues. But the point of today is I want to take it from the standpoint of we are behind the screen. Uh, and in fact, I would encourage you, in fact, we may do this as an experiment, that some or all of the, the, the uh, pieces, the performances that have been uploaded are uh, video as opposed to audio. And I'm going to recommend that the, we listen through the first time. Uh, well, we could do an experiment. Why don't we listen? I think we're going to listen to Haley first. There's more to it before we really get down to it that I want to talk a little bit about. But maybe we'll listen to Haley first, watching her perform her excerpt. And then maybe immediately we'll go back and I'll ask you all to close your eyes and listen again. Or is it better to do it? The, I'm trying to think because this is not a plan that I had worked out in my mind because the obvious the alternative, there's only really two, would be to listen to it with eyes closed first and then see the opposite. Maybe that's better. Anna, my advisor, Anna, is suggesting we listen with, with eyes closed first. That does make sense in a way because then we won't be able to even call up in our minds having watched Haley perform. So, and I want you to try to take note the best you can 
it's not a totally you know clear uh, uh, experiment scientific experiment but it's I think will work for our reasons and now I'll tell you why it is I learned this especially when I got on the other side of the screen when I got a job and the the, the orchestra I played in I played in for 27 years which was an uh, a, an orchestra with a CBA a collective bargain agreement part of the Ixam orchestras was the New York City Opera. Now it's an orchestra that ran auditions in a, from a professional orchestra point of view along the lines of what one expects in that world. Uh, as uh, uh, Professor Powell has pointed out already, these skills are useful when you're applying for a summer festival, for a program. I mean, it is not only for that reason. But... Um, as every, virtually every musician I ever knew that made it to the other side of the screen, like me on a jury, has said after listening, God, if I would have realized now, then, what I know now about listening to auditions, boy, I would have been, you know, I would, I would have been dangerous, you know. And so I thought years ago, how can I jumpstart this process for my students? And so the idea was that I've used repeatedly in my various uh, classes and and in summer festivals say like a National Orchestral Institute or things like that orchestra training festivals is to set up a screen now in the real world that screen is there for anonymity uh, because of the, to try to eliminate to the very best amount possible uh, any bias and that bias can go from just, that's my buddy auditioning right now, to, you know, I don't think women should be in orchestras, or I don't think this particular person of this race or, or creed or orientation should be in my section, you know? And then that is just really not good. And uh, often I've pointed out that there was sort of a magic pill that must have been sent to all women when the screen went up in the orchestra world because all of a sudden women were good enough to get jobs in orchestras in the United States. And that must have been some miracle cure that women all of a sudden started to play so much better. And obviously, you know, I'm being facetious. They were playing just as well as they did the day before. But now, for certain people, they were not being biased. Or maybe all of us. We all have biases as we're learning. Small microaggressions or other biases that you would swear you didn't have in the way you, you think about things. And I'm willing, I'd like to think I'm an open-minded and person that really, if, if, that appreciates and welcomes everyone, but I'm sure I'm not perfect. I'm sure I'm not perfect because I'm human. Therefore, I am not perfect. And so having the screen up has allowed people to at least try and throw away and to a great extent to put away their biases by at that moment and that's um only a good thing the only possible negative about it and that's why a group like orpheus cannot do this is the interpersonal aspects of teamwork that is an orchestra are harder to assess behind the screen and thus See, in Europe, it is virtually the, the rule that an audition is held. Two or three finalists are found. Each one then gets a trial in the orchestra. Right? And this, this is how they do it. In the American process, it, that can sometimes happen. Other times, it comes down to tenure. So you get the job. Now you're on the job. And a year later, you're out of a job because the things you were exhibited behind the screen did not convert into playing on the job. Now, that's not what we're getting into today. We're getting into how to, how to pass the audition. But I want to point out how much this all works together. And I learned this in my career as a player, because I went for some big jobs that I did not get, and as a listener. Uh, 
I would say, basically, the reasons I did not get those jobs, other than the fact there are some really great players out there that I was up against, was my preparation, the way in which I presented myself as a player, was not appropriate to win that audition. I have only myself to look to. And you must take responsibility for yourself. If you want to get anywhere in this world, that doesn't mean you have to hate yourself, but you have to take responsibility. And that's just the way it is. And in that way, you can improve. Therefore, you're doing yourself the biggest favor by doing so. So I learned that over time. Luckily for me, without getting into my biography, my weaknesses in that area, certain individuality and character in playing, sometimes maybe over the top, in my own mind, let alone some other people's minds, led me to be successful in those walks of life, so to speak, and career that I have found myself to be successful. So I found a way for myself. And in the course of my failures and successes, and in helping my students, I've tried to come up with certain truisms that I, I, I think you know, a collection, a collection of facts or small facts that can be combined to help one be more, more successful. Okay, now, everything is subjective. I'm about to say something, that there are certain objective aspects to your preparation. In tune, intonation, good rhythm, the right notes, no kidding attention to the details on the page, and I would recommend playing within a tradition of how within the, you might say, uh, art, so the musical society in which you are audition, auditioning, playing in a way that fits that tradition. If I had thought to go and to try to make a career in Germany, the first thing I would have to do as a reed player would be to buy some German reeds from some of the professional reed makers that actually supply some of our most well-known leading bassoonists of the world and of Europe. Because I play in the American style. In fact, my, in American, what is American style? It's like 12 American style, whatever. It's a big country. And we've had a lot of great teachers from whom the next generation such as mine have come. And they all taught differently and played differently. But there are certain way, qualities of sound, etc. So you must consider those things. When I have a student from Europe, as I have had, or even from the Far East, one of the questions I often ask them is, are you planning to stay here or go home? Where do you want to be successful? And uh, that then informs me a little bit about how I teach them. Or how I, how, and in doing so, not to say, therefore, I'm not going to teach you this thing, this secret is an American secret, but saying, all right, we can work on this, but you're going to have to then translate it into the aesthetic in which you're going to find yourself back home or in Europe, which of course encompasses many styles now, especially now and these days. And people, you know, German style. What's the German style? The first bassoon. In, uh, in, in the Berlin Philharmonic is an Italian guy, and uh, one of the first bassoons in the Vienna Philharmonic is a woman, Sophie, and, and uh, Sophie Devereaux. I was thinking of her married name now because she changed, she's using her married name, Devereaux. And um, so wh what's the Viennese style? Sophie Devereaux from France? And she plays in the appropriate style, but th that's my point. All right, but it, you have to understand the style in which you are placing yourself in terms of an audition. So you have to understand a basic style. If you want to play eccentrically, either in sound or in approach, you may very well find the orchestra or the conductor that says, I love the freedom of this person's playing, or I love that point of view. But, you know, you're, 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 uh, you're pushing the margins in terms of consensus. Okay, so that those are almost objective, almost. Intonation should be objective. 
But I know for myself, I have a good ear, not a great ear. When I listen to auditions, say at the Juilliard School where I've taught, with my colleagues from some of the Lincoln Center orchestras, without naming names, although I'm about to say something complimentary, a couple of them have a much stronger ear or perhaps perfect pitch, something I don't have. And when they hear somebody play, they can be usually much more bugged by someone's playing than I am based on intonation. I'm just not as receptive to it. So therefore, is it objective anymore? Or is it subjective to how allergic one is to intonation or to using vibrato or uh, rhythm? I like free playing. Someone else might hear a certain interpretation and think it's weak rhythm. Right? That's why the traditional approach to playing solos is important uh, within parameters, but a traditional approach. Now, one of the things I have learned the most, or the attribute that I feel is essential in great playing is exactly how I've been zeroing this course into this day. And that is staying within your sound, creating a focused, com controlled sound, and, and maintaining the line from the inside and resonating each note to the next note, whether it's fast or slow, high or low, tongued or legato, lyrical or technical, to use the term, technical. That kind of playing already separates you from 90% of the players, maybe even higher. I'll leave it at 90, not to sound too, like, wigged out. <laughs> Barking at the moon, sitting on the park bench. Old man, you know. And you know what else? 90%? Yeah, I won't get into that. So that's just the fact that I have learned from hearing many, many auditions and hearing many great players. In terms of rhythm, and we have talked about some of this, about how to use the metronome, we're going to get into it again today. It is possible to have a concept of an underlying rhythm. I think I played for you a recording of myself just opening of the Rite of Spring with a click going to show you how I could play it in a disciplined way, yet sound musical. And f hopefully, to my thinking, obey what was written on the page. So, or pay, uh, pay respect to, you know, to what's on the page from the composer. So, so the concepts of what we've been working on in terms of the vocal style, getting into the sound, proper vibrato, proper articulation, all of those things, deconstructing and constructing an excerpt so that you can call it upon it when you need it and be accurate and prepared from the first step in the audition. All of that stuff was leading us to today. Now, the thing is, we're talking about it in auditions. And like uh, Maestro Powell said, the A word, the fact is, I'll tell you one other personal thing about myself and my point of view about this, then we're going to get down to work. I think we'll have covered enough territory. Because I came from the generation where the, uh, the screen went up. And I was some hotshot at Juilliard as a kid. And in the past, maybe, you know, some conductor would have called my teacher. Actually, he did. And say, who do you got? You know, I need a first bassoon out in some orchestra, which in those days was 26 weeks, is now 48 weeks, although they're not working, or 50 weeks or 52 weeks. But the thing is, I um, those days are over. And my teacher did instill in us more of a soloistic kind of playing. And as I said, that worked out in my own career. I'm not blaming him. I, I thank every day of my life, literally, that I studied with Stephen Maxson. So none of this is criticism of him. I mean, I would not be where I am today without him. That's it. Simple, stated, clear as, as one can put it. And I owe him a complete lifetime of gratitude. But, and he was, he knew his audience too. Uh, that was what I was really better at doing and capable of doing. Anyway, long story short, when I would take some of these auditions and really think I had played well and not get as far as I thought I should, 
you know, it's very possible to get sour grapes over that, to become, you know, you have to play people, you have to play in a box, you have to do this, you have to do that. Well, it's true. <laughs> Some of it's true. And I have to say, sometimes I hear orchestral players play extremely controlled and smooth and in a line. But to, for me, devoid of expression, and it makes my flesh crawl. But the playing itself is excellent. And I've heard conductors tell me that I've mostly, when I've been playing chamber music with them, you know, pianists that, or violinists that are also conductors, that sometimes if they close their eyes, they can't tell what orchestra they're in front, anymore, in front of anymore. In other words, things have become, become standardized. And that's what comes from a consensus approach, approach behind the screen. That is a reality. Right? That is a reality. But then I thought, no, wait a minute. The great artists I get to play with, especially in Orpheus, where we backed up the greatest singers, violinists, pianists, etc., of the world with no conductor there. And that's not to, anything against conductors, but because of that, a much more intimate relationship in preparing the piece and hearing their thoughts and analyzing their playing the same way they're analyzing ours. I realized those great players, no matter how, except for one very idiosyncratic person I won't mention, who I really thought is off the wall, but I won't mention this guy's name, it's a, a man, that, um, that they play with those values. They play with great intonation. They play with a great c control of their sounds. They play with an underlying sense of rhythm that's ironclad. So one does not have to give up being an artist. To, to identify with these other, as I call them, more objective aspects of music making. And that has been my manifesto, my goal, my, my, you know, uh, my journey as a player and as a teacher. W wage beautiful music, but do so within a certain confines of of the most accurate kind of playing, not to the extent of, not to the extent of becoming locked, frozen, strangled. So that's how I have been able to make what was a difficult situation for me personally into a very positive and challenging, in the best sense, artistic journey over decades as a player and teacher. Did you want to, Mark? Just had a quick quick question, and that is given given that journey and given what you've done as a, as a teacher and as a coach and as a mentor, do you find members of younger generations with similar kinds of paths, similar kinds of stories to yours right now? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, it, yeah. This is, yeah. We're talking about the orchestra world right now. Yes. And, right. 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 And so, yeah, that's a particular uh, path. But I mean, last week, Amani Wins was here among her teachers. I don't I ever like to take credit for any one student, you know, like their success, although I give my teacher total uh, because he deserves it, uh, total credit for anything good I've done. But uh, I don't expect that, and nor do I believe it. But Monica Ellis was my student at the Juilliard School in Manhattan School of Music for three years. And over the, the, the span of time was three years. And uh, Peter Kolke, who is quite a well-known solo artist, teaches at Vanderbilt, was my student. And Lacolian Washington, who's now in Boston running the, it's at the Settlement House. I forget the name of it. Music. The Settlement School there, yeah. The settlement School. Yep. He is now their director and a wonderful bassoonist, was my student. And Dante Rameau uh, from Ottawa, African-Canadian from Ottawa, is, is founded and, and runs the Atlanta Music Project after having been involved in the El Sistema program to learn. And uh, Marty Kuskman, who teaches in Denver at the Lamont School, and is sort of the rock and roll concerto soloist of the bassoon kind of wild man. He was my student, as well as Mr. Maxim's student, my teacher's student. And um, they all f have walks of life more similar to mine. 
uh, than uh, the corporate world, as I call it, of orchestra <laughs> playing. But that's important to think about, and I, I, I thank you for thank you for casting the mirror in that direction because for undergraduates and graduates right now who are in the midst of their study, notwithstanding COVID tide, I'm I'm looking both backward and forward beyond that. But some of the best parts of my career have come from the fact that it was a tremendous mixed bag of experience with loads and loads of viewpoints. And I look upon that only as an advantage. And I just, I thank you for spending the time on that. I really think that's important. No, I, I believe you must, you must, <clears throat> to be a musician, I'll say again, one more thing on this. We have time and we have three people to play and I wanna make sure that they all have adequate time. And then we could always come back next week but with the same, you know, with someone of this group, but that's not my, my goal, is um, that, well, now, well, I'm trying to think what it was. Oh, yes, that the orchestra world, when I was a student, was in the 70s, the early 70s, because I'm old, to the mid-70s. The, the union paper would be filled with Boston Symphony has gotten up to 48 weeks in their new contract, et cetera. The Chicago Symphony's at 50. There was this rush by what was then the big five to get to a 52-week season. In my teacher's day at the Metropolitan Opera, I played the City Opera, which was seasonal work. So in the course of a week, I could play the American Composers Orchestra, Carmen and Traviata at the City Opera, rehearsals or performance with Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, and teach. I love it, man. That is like the most crazy but happening thing. And I wouldn't trade my career for anybody's. I don't care who they are. And that's no offense to anyone else. I just love what I do. I love what I do. And I have loved what I have done. And I am the most grateful guy going to, ha to think that I've been able to have that in my life. I can't even believe it sometimes But when I think about it. But, but I do feel that way. The orchestra is, as a full-time job, it's a very recent development in the United States. And economic pressures, again, pre-COVID, absent the plague, uh, would make the fact that there will be as many full-time orchestras in the future unrealistic. That doesn't mean the music business is dying. It just means you have to be a musician, not just a corporate, not just a member of a corporate of a corporation and uh there are people i i was i was in new york so i'm playing at city opera not a bad not the met not a bad group not the top group playing orpheus considered one of the great orchestras of the world the chamber orchestras of the world and chamber music with the very best people at the chamber music society and major festivals and teaching part-time at such places like the Juilliard School or Yale and now at Queens College. So because I'm in New York, I get a chance to have these more hot shot and name opportunities. But people live my life all over the country in terms of having university positions or adjunct part-time positions or full-time positions like Peter Colte, who then goes out, or Marty, who then go out and and play all sorts of solo and chamber music concerts and, and orchestra playing at times. Or Monica, who is teaching. I don't, she doesn't have a full-time, you know, Marty and, and Martin Kusman and, and Peter, I think, both have full-time. And another one of my dear students, Laura Kepke, who is at Fredonia and has a fantastic class going, is also performing and playing, so, you know, orchestra and chamber music. There are people, I'm only talking about bassoon because I'm in the bassoon world. I mean, obviously, every other instrument it's the same deal. But these people are pursuing the same kind of life I do within their communities at a very high level and with great success. I just happen to be in New York, you know, and it's kind of, uh, you know, the New York comes with a certain cachet to it. But I'm not superior. It's just where I happen to be. So I got lucky. I could make it here. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. That's me. And let's be brutally honest. You're a little bit superior. 
no, 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 no. I don't think I, I don't have to go there. That's not the point. No, Thank but you. that's for other people to decide. And as yeah. a colleague, I can say right. that with love. Oh, okay. I guess then I'll have to accept the compliment. But but that's the point I'm making is you could have a great life without having a full time job. It's what you make of it. Okay. Now, after all of that, that was more talking than I intended to do. I hope it was at least somewhat useful to you. So now, let's listen to Haley. And she's going to do the opening, the afternoon of a fawn solo. Right, Haley? That's what you have. And I am going to uh, close my eyes and listen to Haley. And I hope you would all do the same. And let's listen to her without um, watching. Now, here's the deal. And when I do this kind of class, I usually I don't ask. Some teachers will have where, you know, he, he wants or she wants the students to write down their observations as if they were on a jury. I'm not interested in that, no offense. I want you to listen to what you hear. And the things you hear Haley do, which she will, that you find really good, you should think to yourself, I want to aspire to do that as well as Haley does it. And if there are things that you think, oh boy, Haley could do this better or that better or made that kind of mistake, or whatever it means to Haley, if I was playing, that vibrato is too present or something in my playing, you could have, make that critical analysis of my playing. But the thing that will be useful to you is to remember you're probably making the same mistake or you better make sure you're not. <laughs> so that's, to me, a much more useful way for the students to be involved in this. In other words, you're going on the other side of the screen. Listen critically. What about what you hear is useful to you? In terms of, that sounds really good. I should aim for that kind of presentation. Or, boy, that could have been better. I have to make sure I don't make that mistake. Of course, we all make mistakes. And Haley's an excellent player. We have Emily and Anna as well, all really great young artists. But there's always, as we all know, there's always something you could say. Someone's always going to have an opinion. That, you know. So, uh, and we all just want to be better. We don't have to look for excuses. It's all about getting improving, self-improvement. Music is an independent sport like diving. You know, when someone goes up on a diving board, the next diver can't go up there and like shake the board as the person goes to set their dive. It doesn't work that way. I dive, you dive, judges judge. Winner is the one that gets the highest score. Right? That's the music biz. Improve yourself. You're not in competition with anyone else. You're in competition with yourself. You're in competition with excellence, the image of excellence. And that's what I'm trying to describe for you. What is excellence? What are the things you need to aspire to? If you aspire to those things, and as my teacher used to say, one more thing, you know, Imagine a pyramid, a pyramid of excellence. And you were climbing up that pyramid like the Sun Pyramid outside of Mexico City. And you're going up the side. Every time you go up the step, you are on a, a ring, let's say, that has, is shorter, that has less length, less volume. Fewer people could stand on that ring. You climb a few more steps, the same thing has happened. There are fewer people there. Otherwise, there'd be no such thing as excellence. Everything would be the same. If you continue to self-improve, if you continue to push yourself to the highest level you can make, you are more competitive, but not because you are competing other than with yourself to improve. Improve yourself. That's the goal self-improvement and everything in your life. Try to be a better person, a better spouse, a better friend, a better community member, a better musician, right? Just try to do better. That's it. See you next week. Okay, let's listen to Haley, and uh, I'm not going to listen to her uh, as much as I enjoy Haley and we're friends. I am going to close my eyes and listen to Haley, only her flute playing.
that it? That's as much as you were going to do? Okay, good. That's fine. Now, let's do it again. Let's hear it again, and this time we can watch Ellie play. anybody in the audience in our class have a thought did, did it sound the same to you or different now of course we heard it a second time so that's why the test is weak in that we heard it a second time not just that we only like it anyway that's the best we can do under the circumstances is anyone in the audience does anyone in, in the class want to just volunteer you could speak up instead of waiting to be called on does anyone did anyone notice something about it the second time that was different um i noticed the second time it was a little more distracting to also have that visual part but on the other hand you could kind of see the phrasing the way she moved with the music so i don't know if i necessarily liked it better but it was definitely different okay that's a great answer um we um it, it you know it it is distract i mean it's like a brain function thing i'm sure we could get a a neuroscientist on here to explain from all these times i'm sure you know they map the brain they have people listening to certain things or doing certain things and they pew, 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 and they could match how the brain is firing how did the how does the brain fire differently if we watch haley play versus if we listen to haley play or, which might be really interesting, if we only watched her play but couldn't hear it. I mean, that would be a good experiment, right? That would be a wonderful experiment in terms of judging somebody. How do they look to you? Do they look friendly? Do they look angry? Do they look uh, nervous? Do they look competent? Do they look scared, you know, right? It could happen. Uh, Mark, did you... There's uh, there actually... Uh, uh... Chris Cavaretta just put something in the chat that I was just about to mention. And it wasn't that I thought differently. I just noticed a couple of things that I didn't notice without the visual. And Chris's comment is that there's a bit more clarity to the dynamic. Um, my ear fell on the first and second articulations, Haley, when you came back to the home pitch at the top. The first one was this delicate, beautiful, it's approached perfectly. And then when I saw you play it, I went, oh, that all of a sudden sounds louder. So again, it's minutia, but right to Professor Morelli's point. And thank you, Christopher, for putting that in the chat. I, I felt I liked the sound a little bit better when I watched you play than when I listened alone. And I liked it both times, but if I had to, like, now, like you said about minutia, man, I'm listening, you know, trying to answer this question is, like I said, it, it, I haven't really done that before. This is the first time I've done it, this idea of let's not watch Haley play, let's watch Haley play. And use literally the exact same performance because it's a recorded performance, which makes it more, more of a controlled experiment than if we said, all right, play it again now, Haley, because now she played it already, you know, that all of those things dilute the test aspect of, of this process. Okay, so uh, what I would, and of course now we also were stuck with the, the vagaries of uh, recording qualities and, and techniques and all that. But when you're, if you were putting a recording in for a, uh, a recording round, we used to call it tape round back in the day when people actually used tape for the, t uh, yeah, I have to, you know, the Met says I have to, I have to send in for the tape round before I'm going to get a live audition. That's what we would call that for you young people. So, uh, 
So that would be the same. Haley would have been producing an audio tape, an anonymous audio tape for the, the first round, audio recording. So what I would love to hear more, Haley, and some of it could be the recording, but we're just going to accept the fact the recording is the recording, and my advice is relevant, whether or not it's totally reflected in the performance, is even more sense, as we've talked about, to be right in the middle of the sound as you start that, so that you can change that color on the sustained note as you go through the phrase. In this recording, it sounds ever so slightly hollow. And again, it could be the miking. It could totally be the miking. But, but we're talking about what we're aiming to do, whether that one performance reflects all of these, what I'd like to think of truisms on my part, those are the things to look for. That as we've talked about that idea, if you remember back about the sound having the two circles and the middle one being the core and that the phrase is directed from the core and not just like get louder or softer. In fact, those things can sometimes counter the phrase. So I'd say to the extent you can start that, and I'm not a flute player, so I don't know how you do it, but even more of a concentrated sound so that then you could add more meat to its bones as you had as you blossom that first note uh, joseph could we hear it one more time so listen for that idea you started the first note and I was, I, the, to the extent that you can improve, and this goes for anyone playing a sustained note like that, or the ba 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 in the in the Scheherazade clarinet note or bassoon sustained note, when you're on that note, whether it's the first note or the fifth note or whatever note it is, he has, WC gave you that note. And I believe he wanted you he was hoping to see the prism of color expand in it as you play it. And the other thing to remember is your sound is your calling card on everything you play. But on the slow excerpts, the lyrical excerpts, sustained sounds, you want to captivate me from the moment you start that note, you want to go, okay, Morelli, you're listening to me. You're listening to me. You can't go anywhere. You can't think like I need a gallon of milk to pick up on the way home or, oh, uh, yeah, I like that suit jacket. I like that suit that guy's got on in the next row. I wonder where he got that. Is that from, you know, whatever, you know. No, I have to listen to you play this phrase. I can't even breathe until you let me go. So you want to spin that kind of web. You want to spin that kind of wizardry. And you have a beautiful sound and beautiful expression. So this is the way you can enhance it. That's all. So let's hear it one more time. With video or without? Oh, did you turn it off last time? I just closed my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I turned, yeah, I turned it off. No, do it without. Do it without. So we really are forced, in a nice sense, to focus only on Halley's sound. Okay, thank you. That's the one thing. If I don't run it, then that. The, but I, I, I asked Joseph to run it because when I try to do that, you see me. I get it becomes a comedy of errors. So I appreciate that Joseph's doing this for me. Um, maybe you don't think it's so funny. I like trying to say it's a comedy of errors anyway. But I would love Haley, and we've talked about this in class, in our own class, that idea that there's this inexorable subtle but an inexorable move towards that second note could be just a little bit more it's internal it's more covert than overt that's for sure but you can go for that i you know i don't have the music in front of me although the music is up here i see i didn't open it uh and it was here um 
so I should I should before you know I'm talking out of turn in a way. Is there what is the dynamic of the first note, and, and there's any indication on in dynamic going to the second note? And you could tell it's while I'm opening it right now. I'm in the midst of you know getting it open. Up oh, here it is. All right, soft and expressive. Mm -hmm. Soft and expressive. Is this from Jeannie Backstress's book? I imagine. One of the biggest tricks in music is how to how to get off a long note, and you have to remember not to lose, not to lose to to stay leaning into like against the resistance of that note, so they keep spinning towards the second note, and then that the bridge to that second note really direct and clear not a heavy-handed way but that real absolute bridge to it now i see i got the music up so uh, i should have had it up before actually uh, all right joseph just continue where we stopped where you i made you turn off the machine or just run it again either way it doesn't matter Which you say you were? Frank, would you say the, the very first part of what you just asked, it, it cut out just there at that moment? Oh, the B. When you were on the B, and then I love the way you played the last two notes. That, to me, you showed more of the color change. Were you thinking about setting on that B to be able to control the last two notes? You were, because, you know, you've heard me say that more than once. I'm sure your teacher tells you, too. She has an excellent teacher. Keith Underwood, right, is your teacher, and he's fantastic. I only know him for 45 years or something like that. But anyway, um, that in order to make the move on those last two notes, and we talked about this, that idea that you must get into a physical position so that if you reduce the amount of air on those last two notes or however you change it, you can keep them under control, basically keep the core under control. And so I heard a beautiful, just subtle, it's impressionist music, just like impressionist painting. There aren't a lot of primary colors coming flying out at you. Things are so much more subtle than that, right? Pastel colored, let's say like Renoir, right? So often. Um, I heard that more successfully at the end than at the beginning. So work on that. That is about all you can do to it because you play so beautifully. I can't say, oh, this and that and the other thing. You could, you know, the, one of the gimmicks we've tried is just hold out a C sharp, spin that C sharp for a couple of measures, and then uh, and then go back and add all the other notes in just to feel the sense of direction the other thing i'd say is in the end of the second bar if anything you might write in for yourself a diminuendo so that when you start the crescendo the hairpin like you kind of powered a little bit powered in this case of playing a soft excerpt <laughs> but you kind of powered a little bit into that bar which then limited your ability to make that expression as much so you want to see the c sharp i would remind myself i want the c sharp at the beginning of two bars from the end to be subdued <laughs> And when you, so you need the sound, as I like to put it, drop dead beautiful from the first note. You just say, oh my God, he or she is, that's good looking. Or, oh my goodness, 
the Grand Canyon. You know, I remember the first time Mrs. Morelli and I saw it up for real. We had, we had come at night and in the morning it was very cloudy and then the clouds parted, you know, it was like cinematically. It was like the Grand Canyon. It's like, oh my God, there's the Grand Canyon. And so it's like that sound, you hit us with that sound, like I said, and you captivate me. So that we can work on that this evening, if you want. It's up to you, okay? So we'll go on for now. Thank you very much. Beautiful, beautiful playing. All right, excellent. Uh, how about we listen to Emily, just to switch over, and then we'll work with Anna, Anna. And then if we run out of time, we could work some more with Anna next week, or Anna and I, we, Anna, we could. Frank, your audio is is cutting out. Make sure your your mic or your contact is plugged in. It's just cutting out in the middle of sentences. Keep keep talking. Not not getting audio. It's very intermittent. We'll get like a sound of silence or a second of silence and a half a second of audio. Are you working on a Yeti Blue? Make sure the the USB cable at the, at the bottom of the mic is in. Everybody else getting the same kind of intermittent audio? Okay, yeah, it's systemic. We're going to have to maybe go to the audio in your uh, computer. Okay, I've gone over to my computer. Is that helping? Yes, we're good. Oh wow! Thank you. All right. It can be okay. a dirty contact. It's not. It's not a huge thing. Okay. All right. I'll deal with it later. Sorry about that. So let's let's go on to Emily though. I apologize for that. So Emily, you have Bolero, I believe. Okay. So in this case, we, we were actually watching Emily listening to herself playing <laughs> instead of watching her play. I should have had my eyes closed, but I, uh, I was listening intently. So again, you, what do you notice? I mean, one thing I notice is the key clicks. I know that auditions, that some people are bugged by that. That should have nothing really to do with your performance but it's important to make sure your instrument is silent. You like oil it up before an audition, before you make play an audition live or a recording. Um, the beginning, uh, it's really the same deal as, as Afternoon of a Fawn. It's getting into that first note and then moving along. And then of course, one of the games in Bolero is, is time. And for that, I suggest, for instance, practicing bolero, along the lines of what I said earlier about making music but answering to the higher authorities of intonation and rhythm, as well as right notes. 
is to practice bolero at 24. If you're thinking about 72 as a basic tempo for bolero, um, that um, by doing it at 24, you can, um, it makes you, yep, Professor Powell's checking out. How'd I do? Well, I can't hear you. No, it was, that was, I should not have made that that obvious, but I, I've, I've, all of my lessons this week has been about pegging tempos and about memorizing the, you know, the, the tunes that give you 60 or 120 yeah. or what have you. And, and my low 70s have always been a little shaky, so I just tested myself. And how'd you Thank do? you very much. You did, you did very well, and I did very well. Thank you. Oh, phew. Safe. Glad to have my, my pronouncements backed by, a, by an authority, an eminent authority. So, so the idea of practicing it at 24 means you must, you must do more of the internal rhythm, but then meet up, match up to, answer to, so to speak, the metronome one measure at a time. And that is a way to keep it really secure. You were pretty much secure most of the way in a couple of pauses along the way to be careful for. Um, can we hear it? The other thing, uh, so the read, the read sound, and then the other, other thing is creating, again, a, a focused piano sound um, that then you follow through the excerpt and keeping it really together. Can we hear it one more time, Joseph, please? Okay, now we could stop. Now, that in Bolero has an accent on that last B flat. Ba -da 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 -ba. And the question is why, and I think I might have already brought this up at a previous uh, class, but it occurred to me after years of banging my head against the wall and having read or heard something which I've never been able to find again, and perhaps Professor Powell knows what I'm referring to, but Bolero is a 4-4 four -four melody written out in 3-4. Because it's da 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 and there's an accent there which Ravel wrote. And it took me years to figure that out. And then I realized, and after something, I would tweak my interest in it. So I wish I could ascribe it. I could attribute this thinking to where I kind of heard about it, but I don't know. I haven't been able to find it again. But all of a sudden that that note is obviously on a beat, and that's the last one of the B-flats, and one would probably most likely aim for it if one were looking at a 4-4 version. So Ravel says, my musician may not aim for an accent on the second beat because we're not trained to accent second beats. So I am going to put an accent on that and say, this is the B-flat we're aiming for. And therefore, it's very important. How do you start so that you can find your way to that accent appropriately and have a sense of it moving through the line very much like the afternoon of a farm? It's almost, it's literally the same concepts, except on the flute, relatively low register, low middle register on the bassoon, relatively mid high register, upper middle high register. But the goals are the same. And this is that idea of staying in your sound and sculpting an absolutely clearly etched line. That is successful on auditions. Other things are not. They're just not. It's, it's not going to meet up to people that can do this, do what I'm talking about. And of course, play in rhythm, because that's the easy way to get rid of you. It's rushing, bad rhythm, you're out. You know, it's out of tune, bam, you're gone. So those are easy, you know, those are easy. You want to play with such a fastidious, in such a fastidious way that you are forcing the committee to listen to you and to come to a conclusion. In the early rounds, what you want them to conclude is, this is really a good player, we should hear him or her again. Then as you go along, 
then you have to be an artist and you have to accept the fact some people aren't going to like your sound or they're not going to like your vibrato, even if, let's say, it's really great or your music making. That person is too dry a player, too obvious a player, and we have to take our lumps <laughs> for that, right? Can we hear it one more time through from the beginning? So be listening, people, for this idea of that uh, the, the line should be moving to the last B flat, um, and let's hear it again. Okay, you can stop it now. So the first line didn't move enough to the accent on the B-flat, which basically wasn't there. Then in the next phrase, it's... Which is another accent Ravel put in. On the second beat. Let's see. Da, 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 da. There it is. Bum, 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 bum. Now it's on a downbeat. Dee, dee, da, dee, dee, da, dee, da, dee, da, dee, da, da. So uh, you have to go to the accent that he's written. So the way you have to differentiate is. Dee, dee, da, dee, dee, da, dee, da, dee, da, 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 da. So you have to be much more uh, um, aware of the markings. And at the beginning it wasn't really clean, so that would have you would have been out right there. Be da 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 dee da da da. Because if you sent in a recording uh, of something, uh, then I'm also listening at it to say this was the best a person could come up with, and uh, they thought this was an acceptable take to send in. You know what I mean? That's just how it works. Uh, that's not a uh, criticism of you, that's just how people listen. When I hear, for instance, on orchestra, on, on, on uh, when I'm on a jury, either for a competition or, say, for school auditions, pre-screen, if someone sends in their live recital or a performance they did with the orchestra at school because they won the concerto competition, I'm impressed by that because I know that's a live performance. And things happen in live performances if, you, if you're me. <laughs> things happen. So I'm not going to, oh, they missed a note. I'm going to say this is the example of someone playing a live performance of this piece. And that, if anything, I will be impressed by that. As a, and, and if there's a burr along the way, I'll think, yeah, well, yeah, been there, done that. You know, but uh, what is the underlying uh, skill of this person and artistic uh, identity. So that's, we'll, and you know, Emily and I, you, we'll, Emily, we'll keep working on this stuff. So that's the way, that's the way I want you to think about it and preparing it for the next time we work on it. And be careful at the breath you got behind. At the, the breath you took in the, the famous moment before the D, where we all breathe, uh, you lost the beat. So you have to be careful to stay on it. Um, and intonation. Work, keep working on being in tune in the upper register. For the bassoon, every note is an adventure all over the instrument, and up there, even more so. So let's let's go. We're going to start with Anna because she prepared for today, and uh, but we could continue that next week. And certainly, Anna, if you want, we could continue it in the um, in the uh, rep our regular class this afternoon. So Joseph, if we could hear what Anna is offering. Yeah, if you want to play just first to uh, Mendelssohn and then Carmen. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry it got late, but we could do more next week. And I apologize. You're a good person. Thank you for understanding. Is it a recording or a video? I didn't watch. Uh, it's a video. Oh, then, and well, maybe I'll make sure Joe. I'll make sure I'm not watching you. Thank you. 
And one more, is that what you said? And I'm sorry, did you want to do the... Um, you can go all right after with Carmen, so then we can comment on both. Okay, you can't do that in a performance because I'll be sitting there saying, da, da, de, da, 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 you know, afterwards. Now, one of the things, one of the things that um, actually, it's interesting hearing them with the piano accompaniment, you know, of the orchestra, real, the realization, shall we say, of the orchestra. And that's useful. Is that from Jeannie? Yeah, good old Miss Beck Stresser. She's a sweetheart. And her husband's a bassoon player who was also a saxophone player, like I was. He, he kept on with it. He's the one that said, well, I shouldn't say this, but he said, because we both played it as kids and then put it down, and then we were working so hard at playing the bassoon. He said, saxophone's an instrument, you, you can put it down for 30 years, and when you pick it up, you play it better than you did when you put it away. <laughs> and in some ways it was true, because he worked so hard to make a sound on a bassoon and supporting and fingering and all that, and the sax is a little more welcoming in that department at a low level because to be a great sax player is just as hard as anything else, you know, so that's not, uh, okay. The thing that I want to, we're going to work on this some more. I want to work on this for next week because I'm going to give you an assignment. And actually, Haley, you could do the same, although we could also work out in the afternoon. Both of those could be improved, as could the Debussy, by working particularly on maintaining the core and the sound and the vibrato all the way through certain notes in the second one in the Carmen were a little bit like late getting to the vibrato a note would in the bassoon I call it like wah wah a little bit uh, just a little like you could be a little more on top of it and I mean <laughs> almost I mean you know a, a, a smidgen more on top of it the beautiful parts were absolutely beautiful and the Carmen was more successful as far as that goes so the other thing I would say about the piano, I derailed myself. When we listen to these things, as a listener, either either if you're experienced, I played Carmen over a hundred times in performance, let alone rehearsals, just rehearsal and everything else. And we actually we we had that on the audition for first flute when Bart got the job, and that was behind the screen. Actually, I was the chair of the committee, and I I kind of insisted. Some people wanted the screen down, but a lot of our friends were auditioning. And I said, no, I think we should have the screen through the final round because too many people we know are showing up. 
And even for my own benefit, I didn't want to have to own up to, you know, like I, I was going to have to make a decision and it was not going to be based on, on personality. And, you know, I wanted to try to be the best juror member, jury member as I could be. But what I was going to say is when I listen, and in this way, in a way, playing it with the uh, piano is helpful, but in some ways, not cheating, almost like cheating, in a silly sense, cheating is that you have to hear that stuff in your head. You have to play for us as if you know what else is going on in the orchestra. And I remember uh, up at Yale where I teach, and, and we were doing a mock audition kind of thing, and Professor Unjin, conductor at Yale, who was many years conductor of Toronto Symphony, et cetera, and a horn player was playing something out of, I think it was a Mahler Symphony, and the young woman stopped, and Peter said, I liked, I could hear like the cellos come in there and like, so he's listening to it as a conductor and he's hearing this horn player and, and understanding where it is he's putting the rest of the orchestra while you're playing, you know? So when you do the Carmen, knowing where, who comes in, like the clarinet comes in and you change your sound a little bit. Uh, and in the, in the Mendelssohn, work for me at just playing that, legato and nail every single note in terms of sound and then play it absolutely tenuto tongued you know things we've talked about we can work on it this afternoon too but it'd be fun if you worked on this for the week and brought it in next week and we could talk about this afternoon with the idea of becoming more and more clear about every articulation in the in the mendelssohn and it's really the same technique as the Carmen, and it's the same technique, Haley, as the Debussy. So I'd say, Haley, working at just zinging every note in that solo in a row, or doing, as we say, deconstructing it into the scale of notes within it, or intervals, you know, arpeggios and things, thirds, whatever, you know. But with the idea not of fingers, but of being absolutely in the middle of every pitch, and then working from there. Yeah, I just have a question before we finish. So how would I improve my breathing? Because I am struggling a lot because there are only two bread, bread marks in, in the whole excerpt. So how would you approach this? It's like a lot of notes and it's very pretty low for the flute. Right? Well, what I'm saying, well, I would argue, I would like to think this is a good answer, that the more efficient you are at being in the middle of the sound, the less air you will use like setting yourself up to make the most concentrated, excellent sound with the least amount of air possible through resonance, finding a resonant position on your instrument and letting that work for you like a lever. You've heard me say that before. Instead of trying to move a rock with brute strength, like a Calabrese guy like me was, in, was genetically encoded to do, use a lever, use your instrument as a lever and move that rock, move that rock, move, you know, get through the phrase. I know that's a real difficulty, uh, and it's beyond that. I think I, I may not have the answer for you. Like flute players would probably be better, you know, like a genie or your teacher, you know. I mean, uh, Judy, you know, many people or Keith, because of the guru of breathing, of ways of helping you get through something like that. But the more efficient you are at how you play, the less air you use. I mean, that's a truism. Whether it's going to solve this problem is another thing. Is what I mean. Okay, work on it. Let's work on it some more tonight, if you want. And certainly, let's even set up also, uh, yeah, Haley, whether it was what you intended to play tonight or not, even talk about it for a minute or two about how to work on it even more and bring it back next week to this class and, and, and report in and with either the triumphs or the difficulties. And we'll work from there, right? What you learned or what you questioned or how it felt. So I'll see, I'm sorry to, to get to you late, Anna, but we'll continue with it. And thank you. And uh, thank you to my, my Woodwind Rep class family for being here for me today. As you are, I knew I can count on you. And I have wonderful people in the Woodwind Rep class. Well, everyone is wonderful, but I know them the best and they are the ones that turn up. So I continue to know them the best. And I'm grateful to you for your beautiful playing and your contributions, right? All right, so it's we're past time. It's time to uh, 
say goodbye on to the rest of our day and our week. And uh, without getting too particular about it, it's a little bit happier week. A little bit of a weight has been lifted, certainly for people in the arts. So and in education, both. So we hope for a better day. Yep. Thank you, Frank. As always, great to spend a Monday morning with you and to hear more and more of our students. It is always a pleasure. We will see you back here next time. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. See you later, class. Cheers. <laughs>